Hey guys, we're on location in Orlando, Florida, here for the Money Show, pedaling down the path, getting a little exercise. Today, we're doing part three of our three-part series, A Pilot's Guide to Investing. We're gonna talk about emergency preparedness and the idea of being ready as, an, as a pilot and as an investor. Also gonna feature a couple of my Stock Charts colleagues, Arthur Hill, Julius DeKempener, sharing some of their favorite technical analysis books. A lot of movements in the markets today, which we'll break down as well. So. Join me right now for the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist at StockCharts.com. Not in Redmond, Washington, as you could tell from the, uh, the introduction. I have recovered somewhat from uh, recording that about an hour and a half ago as we were pedaling around the resort here in Orlando, Florida. We're here for The Money Show. Um, we're doing interviews starting this evening and then all day tomorrow, all day Saturday. We're going to be interviewing some of the top strategists in the industry that are in town uh, presenting for the Money Show crowd. Uh, and then I'll be speaking uh, Saturday afternoon. So it's got a really, really good event. We've uh, already met a number of uh, fantastic people, including a number of uh, Stock Charts users here in town. So um, look forward to meeting uh, meeting more over the coming days. Uh, you know, a lot of uh, interesting moves of stocks, uh, stock market, S&P closing highs again to, uh, to new peaks uh, today. So we're going to sort of break that down and what it means from the short-term trends we saw today, how to think about it in terms of a long-term perspective. Coming up on Stock Chart Steven, also on the final bar, we have some really good content coming your way. After this week at the Money Show, two things are coming up next Monday, February 10th. Grayson Rose is gonna be my guest on this show on Monday. He's gonna be sharing the new function called the Simple Summary. We've had a really positive feedback um, from uh, people that have been checking it out. It basically includes fundamental data now on the Stock Charts platform, including earnings dates, and our earnings releases and uh, valuations and ratios and all sorts of things. This is the beginning of a number of really cool uh, content incorporating fundamental data into our platform. So it'd be great to hear from Grayson on Monday. Also, we have a new show called Behind the Charts. This is uh, basically taking all these interviews that I've been doing with uh, a number of strategists and traders, portfolio managers uh, over the last six months and putting them into a weekly interview style show. We're really gonna dig into some of the deeper conversations we've had and let you let you get inside their head a little bit how they approach the markets how they've grown as an investor finally next thursday february 13th market down we'll be doing our youtube live q a go to our youtube channel for stockcharts.com you can subscribe to our channel get notifications and you'll get a ping when we're answering questions live on youtube let's recap the market activity though folks today uh new closing highs on the s p and again what's happened over the last week is we have rotated from distribution coming back to what I sort of called the line in the sand for a while now, the lows from the end of December. We retested that level almost to the penny uh, a couple of days ago, the end of last week, right at the 50 day moving average. And since then have sort of recovered in a, in a pretty positive way, continuing to chip away each of the last uh, four sessions closing at or above the open today, a bit of a doji candle. Um, which if you know your candlestick analysis on the S&P, this one, the open and close are right about at the same level, shows you there's indecision, uh, short term, that tends to be a reversal signal, telling you that we've hit an equilibrium. So all else being equal, that would be actually a short term bearish read for the next day or two, but we'll just have to see what the charts do. Again, as long as we keep doing higher highs, higher lows, the trend is positive. So on the longer time frame, what I would call the primary trend, that positive, that bullish trend continues to be the case. Also worth noting that the S&P is not near the overbought region yet. So it basically suggests we're fine uh, for now until we establish the next peak, and then we'll be able to do the analysis uh, a little further. Looking at the member, member dashboard a little bit, we have the S&P up about a third of a percent, 0.33%. What's interesting, though, today is if you look down below the hood, right? So mid caps actually down half a percent, small caps down 35 basis points. So while the markets, quote unquote, were up, while the Dow, the S&P, the NASDAQ all up pretty well, if you look at small and mid caps, some of the more speculative uh, parts of the market 
actually a little weaker today. So an interesting sort of uh, divergence between the two just on today's trading. Let's look at the sectors here. So comm services, communication services up the most, followed by technology. Then it's sort of a big jump down to the sort of uh, market performers, real estate, industrials, consumer staples. At the bottom of the list, we have energy, which has had a nice little jump back down to the, to the bottom of the returns list today, followed by consumer discretionary, followed by financials. And the XLF was one of our three and three yesterday. If you remember, we talked about that big two-year spacing pattern. We'd broken out to new highs, sort of faltered, and, and financials underperformed going into uh, the new year. And now we're sort of retesting those highs, but it's sort of down at a time when the market uh, you know, finished up on the day. So you know, again, I'm, I'm concerned about things like financials being able to participate or not. Let's look at down at some of the broader themes in terms of ETFs and then at industries. So if we look at ETFs, South Korea, Hong Kong uh, up the most of so some of the Asian oriented uh, regions actually doing very well today. That's kind of a nice change from some of the themes we've seen historically. Down at the bottom, you have the commodity oriented uh, markets of Brazil and Russia. It's really tied to the price of oil, I would think, more than anything. In terms of industries that have done well, if you look, it's a lot of consumer at the top here, as well as communication services, right? So drug retailers, actually the number one group, a nice bounce for the last couple of days after being, you know, a pretty negative chart going into the beginning of February, it's almost turned on a dime and rotated higher. Tobacco stocks actually rallying very, very nice. And again, these, a couple of these, I mean, these are more bottom fishing ideas. I don't know if it's recovered enough to really feel good about it, but it's interesting to see some of those names uh, sort of pop up. One I w did want to highlight is within industrials. If you look at um, the aerospace index, this is the Dow Jones uh, US Aerospace Index. You can see how it's bounced off of the 200 day a number of times. Then I'm always looking to the left to see where we are relative to key highs and lows. And if you see, we're now broken above resistance, just below 1800. This is where it uh, hit a peak in December. And then again, at the beginning of January, now rotating higher. Again, this is more of a range bound market. So you'd really want to get above the peaks from uh, last September, last November, that's where things have consistently topped out. But I think it's interesting to see that the, the group has rallied. It's not overbought yet, starting to outperform a little bit. We'll have to see if that's able to continue, but overall sort of in a position of strength over the last uh, couple of days for sure. In terms of what groups have underperformed, coal, coal continues, excuse me, to be sort of at the bottom of those return lists. It's not been a best uh, the best chart, except for the last couple of days where it spiked dramatically. Today's a little more uh, back down to earth coming off a little bit, as well as some of these other groups. So it's interesting that there are a lot of consumer groups on the top of the list, a lot of consumer on the bottom, including auto parts, which has been a weaker a weaker market, bounced a little bit, but now rotating lower in a pretty, uh, in a pretty big way. A lot of energy groups here in the top, uh, sorry, the bottom 10 or the top 10 underperformers uh, which is uh, which is sort of uh, an issue. And airlines, just to finish up looking at the industries, airlines, and again, this is a bar chart, but that pattern, if you know your candlestick analysis, is a bearish engulfing pattern with a gap higher or an open above the previous day, a close down below, and you engulf the first day's range. So that's overall certainly a, a pattern of uh, distribution suggesting some uh, some relative weakness. So airlines have been tough. I mean, it's not it's not been the most attractive chart. And if you look, it's just been dead sideways for the last year, while the market overall has been in an uptrend. And that's why the relative strength has been so consistently bad. It's a good reminder to not get too excited about a chart like this until you see the improvement in relative strength, because that's when it's starting to tell you that we're outperforming, that we're doing better than uh, we might be in uh, in other places. So overall, that's our market recap for today. And again, a nice up move for the broad indexes, but plenty of things sort of struggling. And I think, again, the most concerning thing I'm seeing are some of the sector themes, especially consumer discretionary financials at the bottom, also small and mid caps not being nearly as strong as, uh, as the mega caps. And one of the three and three, I think for later, we're gonna uh, include one of those for sure. I wanna move on though for this show into our next segment. This is, uh, we have done a three-part series, and this is day three of that series, uh, where we're talking about a pilot's guide to investing. I'm bringing up the presentation for you right here. So what we've done over the last couple of days is talk about, uh, you know, really, I've just tried to share some of my experiences trying to learn to fly a Cessna 172. And I, I tell you, there were moments where I felt like a rock star. There were moments where I felt like I could not do things much worse. Uh, which it's interesting what I just described. I could have described my own uh, you know, experiences investing, of course, as well, which is one of the many reasons why the parallels just abound when you really think about it. As a quick aside, I think one of the worst moments I have is just to tell you about emergency preparedness is when I put the plane in a nosedive. I'm going to share that story with you here momentarily. 
But this is me and my instructor soon after I, I completed my first solo a number of years ago, and it was it felt great to do it uh, because you were finally able to take control, fly on your own without anyone in the cockpit with you. But the real benefit I found since you know my my time in the Cessna was. Uh, you know, spending time with my instructor and talking about investing, to be honest, we talked a lot about stocks and then immediately started to draw parallels between what we were doing with the airplane, the systems we were using, the discipline, taking the emotion out, how we reacted to things, how we planned for things, and just everything we did, I felt like there were things in investing that would make sense, right? It would be a good parallel. So this three-part series, what we've tried to do starting Tuesday, Wednesday, and then finally here on Thursday is to share with you the three uh, sort of uh, key takeaways that I found. Number one, we talked about on Tuesday is be prepared. So the most important work you do flying an airplane is before you ever get in the air. It's what you do on the ground, preparing for that next flight and getting all of your things lined up to minimize the chance of something catching you off guard. The second thing is awareness. We talked about this yesterday, which is basically having a situational awareness, what I call a market awareness, having a sense of what's happening inside the plane and outside the plane. And as investors, we often put the blinders on. We don't have enough of attention of what's happening uh, around us. And as a result, it just ends up being missed opportunities. You'll, you might analyze things okay, but you're not you don't have the best positioning. You don't have the best risk management because you're not aware of what all is happening around you. Today, we're going to finish up with that third piece, which is to be ready. And I, what I've learned, uh, you know, again, in my time uh, learning to fly a Cessna 172R is basically you are, you are taught to be ready. And so things are drilled way ahead of time um, to help you prepare for unforeseen circumstances. And it's basically what happens in an emergency uh, situation. As a quick example, um, I'm smiling in this picture, but I was not smiling on the, the, the day I'm going to tell you here shortly. Uh, we basically, uh, it was the first time I was trying to stall the airplane on my own. And if you're familiar with flying, it's probably you'll, you'll know what I'm getting at. But if not, uh, stalling is, is actually very dangerous. And it's not like stalling your car where the engine stops and you have to restart it. Stalling the airplane basically means you tip the angle of the wings, of the, the leading edge of the wings, to the point where it can no longer generate lift. So you basically have these two long wings sticking out of the body of the airplane, and you put the plane in a condition where the plane can, the, the wings can no longer lift you up, and as a result, you start going down very quickly. And you practice it. You go up to like 6,000 feet, and that's where you practice these uh, conditions, and you do it so that you, you know how it feels, you understand the sensations, and you're drilled, you know it's drilled into you. What, when it usually actually happens is right during takeoff and right during landing. And if you think about that, if you lose altitude very quickly and you're right near the ground, things end very poorly. And that's when stalls can be very, very dangerous. So what you do is you go way up in the air, you go out to a flat practice facility, you make sure that or practice area, you make sure no one's around you. And then you recreate the conditions of a takeoff, you recreate the conditions of a landing, and then you basically force the plane to stall. You put it in the condition where it can't, the wings can't lift you anymore. And what happens, I'll tell you, the first time it happens, your palm, my palms literally are sweating as I'm explaining what it is because it, it gets you so much. But the reason why you do it is because the first time you totally panic. It feels very uncomfortable because you lose a ton of altitude. It feels like you're going to go straight down. But what you learn is that sensation. So if any time during an actual takeoff or landing, you get that same sensation, you know what to do. And you say, yep, I do this and this and this, and you follow the procedures. The first time I was actually given the controls that my instructor had done some stalls and I'd experienced in them for a number of flights and it was finally my turn. What happens when you stall is basically all you're supposed to do is alleviate the pressure. You have to yank the yoke, the, the, the stick. You have to pull it way back pretty hard to get the plane to tip up enough that it stops flying. Um, and what happens when you start stalling is you just pull, you know, you just ease off the, the pulling a little bit. You sort of ease off on the controls and it'll move around a little bit. Overall, the plane will recover pretty easily once you know what you're doing. The first time I did exactly what I was told not to do, which is instead of alleviating the pressure, I pushed forward aggressively. <laughs> and what happens when you push forward aggressively is you literally go in a nosedive. <laughs> Luckily, I had an instructor in with me. He could, took the controls right back, pulled out the throttle, pulled us black. We lost probably 1,500, 2,000 feet in a manner of seconds, and we uh, recovered very nicely and, uh, and landed the plane just fine. Um, and it was a tough experience. It took me a while to sort of recover mentally from that. But eventually, it was a super cool moment when I actually was able to stall the plane on my own with no one in the, in the plane. I felt like I'd accomplished something uh, pretty cool. But the whole point of me explaining that story is you are taught what to do in the case of emergency. What if you stall? What do you do? And, and you don't want to have to look it up or try to rely on your emotional reaction 
to alleviate the problem that you're in, you want to follow a checklist, a very disciplined process to, uh, to recover. So the picture that you're seeing was actually uh, when I was uh, doing one of my long solos and I was actually flying um, from uh, Connecticut down to Rhode Island, um, back up to uh, outside of Boston where my, my home airport was. And I was sort of on the way back. I'd done all the required maneuvers. I'd landed the plane and took took off a couple times at different airports. And I was on my way back, so I was pretty excited, as you can see from the the selfie that I took in midair. To the right of the airplane, off the right wing here, what I'm doing is I'm showing you um, the city of Portland. Uh, I'm sorry, Providence, Rhode Island. You can see the buildings maybe in the middle of there, and this is what Providence looks like from there. It's beautiful, right on the the water. You can see the harbor coming in there for the downtown area. But while I was taking selfies and while I was taking pictures of Providence, I also was doing some emergency preparedness. What you're taught as a, as a pilot is to always have a backup plan in mind. Regardless of what you're doing, even if everything's just fine, you're flying straight level, what's your backup plan? And so off my left wing, this airport that you can kind of see the X-shaped two runways here, that's North Central Airport, just northwest of, uh, of downtown Providence. I knew where that was. I knew if anything happened right at that moment, I knew I could uh, turn to the left. I could bank over there and easily get to that. Even if I had no engine, no power, I had plenty of space to, uh, to glide over there, plenty of altitude. So the lesson here is no matter what is happening, you don't wait for an emergency to start preparing. As investors, though, it's so funny how we do that exact thing, right? When things start to go wrong, that's when we decide it's a really good idea to think about risk management and think about how we're gonna manage some potential downside, some potential capital loss. Uh, you know, and so what I always tell, what have I told my, my clients for a number of years is when you, when you take a position, when you start a position, when you, when you have an opinion, that's when you develop your exit strategy. Before anything else happens, you say, I am long this security, and if X, Y, Z happens, I'm going to get out no matter what. If you don't think about it another moment, write it down somewhere, program it somewhere, and be done. So the way that you actually do this, besides just, uh, you know, when you're flying around, besides just knowing where you're at, and having airports in mind is you have a series of checklists that you follow. So yesterday we actually, or maybe on, on Tuesday, I want to say we talked about the pre-flight checklist, getting ready to get up in the air. This is one of the checklists you use in midair. And so if your engine cuts out, you're flying the, the plane I was learning, you follow this sequence. You basically get your airspeed to 65 knots, which means you can glide the maximum amount. You put the fuel shutoff valve in, mixture rich, and all of that is doing, and then fuel selector valve to both. All of those is just drawing as much fuel as possible from the two wings, which is where it stores the fuel. And then you check the ignition, and a lot of times you either turned off the fuel, it's not able to get enough of it, or you knock the key out with your knee and checking the ignition, you find the key's not there, and you can pop it right back in. And one of these five steps, more often than not, is going to fix the problem that you're in when you, when you lost your engine. So as an investor, what's your emergency checklist? And I, I challenge you to think about what you do in the case of emergency. When something happens that's unexpected, do you have a set of steps that you're going to follow to make sure that you're not in a painful, painful place? And Ned Davis, a, a mentor of mine, once told me, you know, all, all large losses begin as small losses, right? So we don't want to, we don't want to hold on to losing positions, losing trades so long that they cause a climactic pain in our, in our portfolio. So I would refer you back to the technical checklist that I shared with you uh, on, my, on Tuesday, which was basically have a set of steps that you follow to qualify whether or not you should still hold a position, right? So your emergency situation is you're owning Home Depot or whatever random uh, ticker it is, and it starts to go down. It hits your threshold at which you want to revisit whether or not you still want to hold the position. What's on your technical checklist for you to determine whether or not you want to sell it? And it could be we're in an established downtrend, lower lows, lower highs. That might be an indication. We've broken down through some key trend lines. We've broke, you know, the moving averages have sloped downwards and we've broken down through these key trend, uh, key trend lines. We've broken down through a key support level, something like that, right? Uh, relative strength, we might be underperforming its industry or its, uh, its group in, uh, in enough of a way that it would warrant uh, revisiting the, the position. So my point to you is don't wait for a position to hurt before you develop your exit plan, have the exit plan set up. And I would say, as the S&P is going to new highs right now, if you are long equities, now is a perfect time to decide what this exit plan is going to be for you. Because at some point, I guarantee the market is going to move down and you're going to want to have some uh, a checklist ready to go. So that concludes the third part, the three parts of a pilot guide to investing. Be prepared, be aware, and be ready. And if you missed the other two, I'd encourage you to go to our YouTube channel. You can check out the other videos and put the three of them together with some good insights on how to approach investing as a, uh, as a capable pilot. 
We are going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to be back featuring a really cool conversation with Julius DeKempner and Art Hill, some stock charts contributors related to their favorite readings on technical analysis. We'll see you back in a minute. The Chart Watchers newsletter features expert technical commentary about the current market from some of the industry's leading technical analysts. See what's really happening in the markets through their eyes and gain an edge in your own investing. The newsletter is packed full of insightful and educational articles intended to help you become a better investor. Whether you are brand new to charting or a seasoned technical analyst, each edition will provide a wealth of informative content. It's the best way to stay informed on all the latest news, events, updates, and additions here at StockCharts.com. Whether it's a new feature or blog, an upcoming conference, or a special sale, you'll hear it first in the Chart Watchers newsletter. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the show. Thanks for joining us every weekday here on uh, Stock Charts TV for the final bar. As a reminder, would you please keep your questions and your feedback coming to us? The final bar at stockcharts.com is the best way to send uh, some thoughts into us. We appreciate all of your feedback on the show, as well as questions about technical analysis, about the markets, about uh, stockcharts.com. Anything is fair game, and we'll do, make our, do our best to answer all the questions that you send in. For this next segment, uh, our, our production team at Stock Charts TV did a fantastic job. Our producer, Gretchen, traveled to Amsterdam uh, a, a couple months ago and captured some really cool conversations, what we call chart chats, uh, with two of our Stock Charts contributors, Julius de Kempner, who's based in the Netherlands, and Art Hill, who is a longtime Stock Charts uh, expert who many of you know and appreciate, who's based in Belgium. The two of them sat down over uh, some coffee and had some fantastic discussions about investing, about technical analysis, about the markets, um, and we captured a lot of them. We wanted to share with you one of those conversations today. So they actually were chatting about some of the technical analysis books, some of the literature, some of the readings that they did as they were learning technical analysis and why they were so uh, such an impact for them to grow as an analyst. So here's Julius and Art with a chart chat for you. I've read a ton of books on technical analysis, pretty much everything I could my, get my hands on. But if I would have to narrow it down to three books that were actually instrumental in, in terms of how I think on technicals, I think that I have to start with the Bible, which is for me, Edwards and McGee. Absolutely. Tec That's technical a analysis on stock trends. I mean, super valuable. I mean, written in the 60s, I believe, uh, first edition. And, you know, everything in there on price patterns and trend analysis still works today, no doubt about it. Um, another book that, that really influenced my thinking is one of John Murphy's more recent books on intermarket technical analysis. Um, it's, um, it's because, you know, my relationship with asset allocation, looking at the bigger picture type stuff, that's, that ties in really well with what John is doing in that book. Um, and the third one, I think, uh, is a little bit more esoteric. Is uh, It's a Wells Wilder book, but I don't think a lot of people know it. It's, it's called The Delta Phenomenon. I've heard um, of that book. Yeah, yeah. and he, um, it's about moon phases and stuff. And, you know, if you talk about it, it sounds a little bit more esoteric, but when you read it and you know what it's about, um, you'll probably agree with me that um, it's, it's a lot less esoteric than it sounds. There's a lot of math behind it and a lot of cyclical analysis with like sort of forecasting turning points. And, you know, it helps you keep an open mind. Oh yeah, you, for sure. You have to have an open mind. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. And that's true with all of technical analysis. Come at it with an open mind. Yeah, yeah. it's, you know, uh, mind is like a parachute. It only works when it's open. True, true. You know, if I had to pick three books, the first one is pretty obvious. Um, it was featured in Market Wizards. It's Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. Ah, yeah. And that, uh, Jesse Livermore, that is just yeah, a classic. Great, yeah. And everything that was written back in 1926 is still relevant today, kind of like you're saying with yeah. Edwards and McGee. You're going to hear these things that he's saying, you're like, wow. I thought that was just said 10 years ago, but no, it was said over 70 years ago. That's not even a real technical analysis book, right? No, it's really it's, it's on just trading. It's just on trading. It's on it's his not, yeah. observations when he was trading well, yeah. in the bucket shop, exactly. just watching the ticker, the ticker tape. tape going he was past. a ticker yeah. tape reader, yeah. basically. Yeah. And the second one would be Trading in the Zone from Mark Douglas. And that gets into the trading psychology, how to deal with risk, how to deal with letdowns, and how to be a disciplined trader. 
which is really important for aspiring super, traders. Super important. Yeah. And then the third one would be dual momentum investing from Gary Antonucci. Gary. Yeah, and he presented at the MTA. Exactly, yeah, I was there. I saw that talk, yeah. And that teaches you about, especially with stocks and ETFs, stock-related ETFs, how trend and momentum are very important. And he shows you how to use those in a step-by-step -step yeah. manner. Yeah, that's good stuff. These are these are all good books. Yeah, yeah. you can learn a yeah. lot from them. Oh, yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, if you read those, then you're probably already, well, maybe not halfway, but it's a good start. It's a good start, yeah. absolutely. So that was just one piece of some fantastic conversations between Julius DeKempner, Arthur Hill, two Stock Charts contributors, really just comparing notes about a lot of things. I really enjoyed reviewing uh, their conversations and look forward to sharing many of those with you uh, in, the, uh, in the coming uh, weeks and months. I especially appreciated Julius's quote, or a reminder of the quote, minds are like parachutes, they only function when they're open. In that note, uh, let's uh, move right on to the three and three. So at the end of every final bar show, three charts in three minutes. And if these have not been on your radar, I encourage you to uh, pay special attention to them starting now. The first one is the S&P 500 and a uh, form of breadth. This is looking at new highs and new lows on the New York Stock Exchange, and then um, the S&P 500. And what's interesting, you can see how this had been fairly negative from mid-January to the beginning of February on both sides. And also, especially look at how we had started to see some real new lows from the New York Stock Exchange, not nearly as much from the S&P, but certainly on the New York Stock Exchange, we had seen a number, but how that has changed uh, in the last couple of days, right? We're sort of broken out. If you drew a trend line connecting those highs, we've sort of broken that, really showing you how there's been an, a nice sort of reaction move higher. So overall, the new highs, new lows, sort of alleviating that negativity and overall holding up okay. The second chart is looking at the AAII ratings. This is the bull bear uh, vote that uh, survey respondents can make, individual investors, a couple hundred of them respond every week, comes out on Thursday. So the latest reading, an increase in the number of bulls and a decrease in the number of bears, it's almost down to flat. It's sort of even bulls and bears at this point. You can see how it had really favored the bullish sentiment here at the beginning of December. You can see how it gotten very negative in August and last December. Right now, we're sort of dead even in the middle, which I think is sort of how the market feels, right? There's no, you know, as much as we're back at new highs, there's plenty of skepticism, plenty of optimism, and that's sort of what the survey is telling you here. The third chart I wanted to show you, though, we've talked a lot about small cap performance relative to large cap, right? One of the concerning issues on a day like today is the S&P closes higher, small cap and mid cap actually close lower. So where's the participation with small caps and mid caps, and we, we usually look at the ratio of the IWM, which is a small cap ETF versus the SPY, a large cap ETF. Here, we're looking at a little different way. We're looking at the relative performance of the S&P 100 index to the S&P 500 index. So the mega cap stocks, the largest members of the S&P versus the whole S&P. So it's sort of a different way of showing large versus everything. And you can see how this relative performance has been consistently positive for the most part since late September. This was the pullback in August. This is the pullback into the low the first week in October, but even before the low, the mega cap trade was sort of working. And over and all, overall, it's now finished positive for the last uh, 12 months. It had been negative for, uh, for quite a while here. So that is a different way of just showing you that this move we've had, especially in the last week, has really truly been driven by the mega cap names, by the largest names, the small mid cap stocks really not participating to the point that you'd want to see if you were uh, overall very constructive on the uh, on the markets. And ladies and gentlemen, that is our show for today, a Thursday afternoon here from Orlando, Florida. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar to break down the day's trading, connect it to the long-term technical trends. We want to remind you to send your questions to us at any time, the final bar at stockcharts.com via email. You can get to us on Twitter at final bar SCTV or during the show, just go into the Q&A segment, just put in a chat. We'll look at those at the end of every show and make sure we capture them. Tomorrow, we're actually going to be uh, rerunning a show because it's going to be a, a pretty heavy day here interviewing uh, some experts and we'll be back live this coming Monday on February 10th. So we'll look forward to being back with you from Redmond, Washington uh, there on Monday. So for StockCharts.com and StockCharts TV, this is Dave Keller wishing you a very good day. Mm -hmm.